Welcome to this special supplemental teaching on Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 9. I do these once in a while as we go through our Bible study sessions simply to help us see behind things a little bit better. And if you're interested in that, these are good. If you're not, tune it out. It's okay. What I want to talk to you about is something that has been a problem in the church, especially since about World War II, that applies to what we just read in Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 9. Sometimes when we look at Scripture, we have to look at Scripture and say, okay, what doesn't it say? And why doesn't it say that? Okay? And um, in America, we have a tendency to make our own little version of Scripture, our own little version of what we think should or should not or will or will not happen in around our faith. And this is where it becomes glaringly obvious. And unless you sit down and look at this from the backside or say, okay, what's not happening here? What isn't said here? Then we don't really get the picture of what we can do to apply these texts to our faith in a better way. And in a way that we can understand salvation and evangelism and things like this much better. Uh, first of all, let me give a little background to what I'm saying and then we'll tie it into this whole process of the Ethiopian eunuch being converted along the road with uh, Philip and then also the issue of Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus. I think it's interesting that both of these occurred on a road. and We're on a journey through life and I think there's somewhat of a symbolic slash metaphoric picture there that we can apply to, but that's not really where I'm going to go with this one. After World War II, the Bible colleges and seminaries in most of the denominational groups in shall we say Protestant Christianity, and I would believe so in probably some of the Catholic seminaries and in some of the Orthodox seminaries. Uh, at that particular time there was not a lot of educational value being brought forth in the Pentecostal Charismatic camps. They were basically self-taught, self-proclaimed ministers, and they were in kind of a different type of vein even outside of Protestant Christianity. So we'll bring them in later. One of the things that we see going on is this attitudinal adjustment in seminaries and Bible colleges to teach a very simple gospel, to teach a gospel that would help American citizens feel better about themselves in a post-World War II era. Having just went through two world wars, most of those people still alive who survived them uh, we're suffering with a lot of psychological issues and of course uh, the spirituality effects of war uh, are usually somewhat devastating especially to the direct participants in other words the military or the soldiers and so the approach immediately in most Bible colleges and seminaries was to say let's bring about a, a scenario where people can feel better about themselves and their faith and there developed a more concrete process of what had been started back in the um, Great Awakenings of the 18th century, that'd be the 1700s, and the 19th century, that'd be the 1800s. And people like George Whitfield and uh, uh, John and Charles Wesley and uh, many of these traveling preachers who went around started uh, some processes, even Spurgeon started into this process of delivering evangelical messages much more convicting than what we have today. Uh, in, if you even see any today in most of the church. But these evangelical Bible-based sermons, and then at the end of the sermon they would have what would be um, a prayer bench or sometimes it was just a matter of coming forward and standing in front of the minister or kneeling at a rail called an altar rail and at that point coming to a decision to follow Christ. In the post-World War II era, uh, Billy Graham and the likes 
converted that process into repeating a sinner's prayer. And that became a very normal, accepted process in evangelical Protestant circles. Uh, it bled slightly into mainline churches, but not too much. And, of course, eventually was picked up in a very strong, forceful way by the Pentecostal charismatic movement, who sometimes would have altar services for longer than they had preaching services on the same night or same morning or whatever time of the day they had their services. And so thus coming to Christ as uh, your Redeemer and your forgiver of your sins and all of that became an event that was focused on a process and the process was what we would call the sinner's prayer and this is where typically the minister, the pastor will lead those who have come forward or those who have raised their hands or those who are kneeling at an altar to um, say line for line a prayer that asks Jesus to come into their heart and to forgive them of their sins and to make them a new person and I'm varying a lot of different ways this prayer can be said and of course at the end of that typically these people were given a piece of literature about the church, about salvation, about the Bible. They might be even given a New Testament and pretty much sent on their way and after being declared they are a Christian. There is no doubt that this was a conversion process for a few, but for most people it became a false sense of security. And there's a reason we know that. And two events in my lifetime have indicated it very clearly. And uh, one was right after I went into pastoral ministry, and another is happening right now in 2020. The first one was the events of 9-1-1 in our nation. It shook our nation to its spiritual core and it was very interesting to watch people respond with questions about their faith. These are people who have attended church, who thought they had converted their lives and came to the knowledge of the fact that they had problems with God and had not, if truly converted, been transformed and discipled in God's Word, most of which probably realized their heart wasn't tuned in like it should be and probably they were not actually Christians. Again, this is not my job to judge anyone. This is not my job to say they are or aren't a Christian because that's between them and God. And of course, recently in the so-called pandemic of our experience in North America, these same fears and questions have arisen in a lot of so-called Christian lives. Evangelical Christianity, Christianity has seen this glaringly. I've even seen it in the pastorate with other fellow pastors. Uh, the fear, the anxiety, the uh, instinctive drawback, which I understand that, but a lot of the excessive control of fear and the overwhelming anxieties uh, are indicators of either a lack of faith or an absence of faith. And again, I don't exempt myself completely from any of this because we're all subject to these type of anxieties and fears it's what we do or don't do with them. And if we're rooted in faith, if we're rooted in discipleship in Jesus Christ and His Word, we should not have at least as many questions as are being thrown out right now, or as many anxieties, or as many fears. As a pastor, <clears throat> I have also stood at the bedside of those people dying of critical terminal illnesses 
And one of the saddest questions I hear out of the elderly or terminally ill is, and these are people who basically have been churched all of their life, one of the saddest questions I hear is, did I get it right? Are you sure we're okay? Are you sure this Christianity is the right thing? That is devastating because what it does is it brings the whole summation of their life down to a question as opposed to a statement. And I understand some people just never really settle on anything, but these are people who have lived out the life in some noticeable way, done good deeds, showed up at church, lived what probably most people would say is a typical exemplary Christian life, and yet this question remains. I have no doubt that if lightning comes through the roof above me, at this moment strikes me into eternity, I have no doubt where I'll be. And I don't say that arrogantly or boastfully. I say that because I know what happened in my heart. I was not saved at an altar. I was not saved in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. There was a process of many decisions I had to make over a period of months, and I can tell you exactly when those months were. And I can't tell you when they were finished, but I know what the result was. It was a result that brought about a growing faith and a desire for God's Word and a desire to know Jesus more and more. That doesn't mean I've done it all right. It doesn't mean I've been perfect, and I'm not. It means that there is a process going on that was not precedented by a specific process and or event. The problem with people who have come to an altar call and said a sinner's prayer is it may or may not have been their cognitive choice to believe. And here's where we go to Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 9. The Ethiopian eunuch, <clears throat> as he was going along the road, Philip met up with him and explained the scriptures to him in a way in which he was able to make a cognitive choice to believe. Saul encountered Christ on the road to Damascus, and when Ananias came to his room in Damascus as a blind person to heal him and to raise him up in the Christian faith and to see him be filled with the Holy Spirit, it was a cognitive choice that Saul made to allow that to happen in his life and to change him, wow, completely. Neither one of them, the, Ethi the Ethiopian eunuch or Saul, are recorded as ever saying a sinner's prayer. Or they're not even recorded as praying. They're recorded as believing. And that's a cognitive choice. So many people in mainline churches, and I'm talking basically about the long, well-established denominations in our nation have basically been brought into a line of thought that says if you're a good person and you do the right things and you show up at church and you put your money in the plate and you've experienced the sacraments or ordinances of the church, you're okay. And they go off on that thinking that they're Christians when they have never really cognitively said, I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And evangelical circles are no different because they simply accept a event, an event and a process as saying the sinner's prayer, whatever version of that it is, that they're Christians now. I've got my Bible. I did my thing. I'll show up at church when and if I can. I may even put money in the plate. I got baptized, so I must be a Christian, right? And this is the deception in evangelical churches across America. There has been no cognitive choice to believe the truth of it and let that be a transforming truth. I'm not talking about driving you 
to the edge of perfection, but taking them on a journey on the road like the Ethiopian eunuch, on the road like Saul. And you'll notice when each one of those was converted, they still went on the road of quite a ways. The Ethiopian eunuch had a long way to go to Ethiopia, and Saul walked on in, he was helped on into Damascus. This is very, very metaphoric and symbolic of the fact that our salvation keeps us on a journey. And that journey ultimately ends in the presence of Jesus Christ in eternity. And there's no question of that. There's no, maybe I got it right, maybe I didn't. And I do appreciate those who are honest enough to say, did we get it right or is this the right way? I appreciate that. And it's never too late to make that cognitive choice, even moments before mortal death, even days or weeks before mortal death. But I truly want to know that people under the ministry of the Word of God make cognitive choices to believe. And that's simply where you cross the line of decision and say, I do believe, and I know I believe, and I'm going to let that make a difference in my life, just like the Ethiopian eunuch did. And we know through extra canonical writings that he was one of the first missionaries into Ethiopia with the gospel. And there were many that followed after him, but we see the results of that today with the Christian church in Ethiopia. And of course we see the wonderful theological dissertations, church planting, and evangelical work of Saul who became the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. He consumes over half of the text of the New Testament and of course the majority of the book of Acts telling his story about his amazing transformation on the Damascus Road and then what happened after that and the wonderful decisions that he continued to make to follow Christ even in adversity, even in persecution, even in threats of his life. And so these are the things that show us whether someone has just experienced a process or whether indeed they have had a cognitive choice to truly follow Jesus, to be his disciple, and to reflect his life, to be an image of Christ in all they possibly can and in the decisions they make through the rest of their life.